Hello everyone, this is John Eyes at Central Region Headquarters, SSD, and I'd like to welcome you today to our ongoing series of science sharing webinars. Uh, today we have Rod Donovan from WFO Des Moines, and he takes a unique perspective with looking at tornado warnings and the near storm environment and storm structure. So Rod, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks John. So welcome everybody. And it's kind of ironic because we're dealing with land spouts across the area currently, which tends to be the case for Iowa, and we tend to get a lot of atypical type stuff as opposed to the big supercells to our west and southwest um, that's been going on. So current image that you have on the screen is actually a supercell developed over top of Des Moines uh, just earlier this year in May 20th that resulted in a false alarm. And we'll review that case here uh, shortly. But Overall, as John mentioned, uh, what I did is I went back and looked at a lot of our false alarm tornado cases from basically since back since we started polygonology back in 2007 and see what actually stood out and why these storms didn't verify with it. So um, currently there are no other false alarms in there, so I didn't go back. SBC has a paper out, and I'll have the reference for that where they went back and they looked at storms that produced two-inch hail and also uh, 65 knot winds or greater um, to help define supercells that were out there and um, that were false alarms as well. So, um, you know, as you all know, our mission is to protect life and property and certainly one of those big ways to do that is by issuing the life-saving tornado warnings that we all do. And, you know, as we've seen recent studies have shown, you know, the higher the false alarm, rate, maybe the public comes more complacent with our other warnings. So what I did, as I mentioned, went back and looked at uh, the environment and also some storm uh, structure characteristics with them on our tor tornado warnings that were on non-tornadic days. So I didn't look at false line or tornado warnings um, that also were on, that we did verify some tornadoes on that day as well. So that's maybe some future work. Uh, methodology. Uh, also, like to mention that um, Kevin Deitch has now moved on to the forecast office in Louisville, helped out a lot with this. Also, Brad Small, who's one of our senior forecasters here, helped out quite a bit as well, um, helping go through the data and et cetera. So, as I mentioned, in all cases, we're compared. Um, any tornado warning that was issued by DMX, so it's just for central Iowa counties. No, I didn't go outside of our warning area right now. Um, that occurred, once again, on a day that no tornado occurred. And in order to increase the number of cases, we also um, included cases in which no tornado occurred within two hours. Well, that was, that's going to be the beginning part on um, the non-tornado, or days that actually did have a tornado but occurred, um, did not occur plus or minus two hours on either side. So there is also another new paper by SBC. Um, I believe you can find this on their website as well by Smith et al., from 2012, and this is basically a review of different types of storm modes that um, cause tornadic activity across the area. And you can see really Iowa and central Iowa is really a collage of everything from discrete to clusters, QLCSs, lines. We get a lot of land spots, as I mentioned, which we're dealing with today right, um, with all that. And then also the right moving tornadic, seasonal, um, as we're going into summer, uh, we're, you can see generally the focus is more off to our west with the right movers, and we get into more of the, I'd almost call it hybrid type storms um, throughout our area um, with it. And we'll review a little bit of that, but so this is some of the SBC stuff that you can find on that paper. We are definitely at the beginning of it as it kind of more arcs down into the lower Ohio Valley as well, but certainly we deal with our fair amount of QL, QLCS storms. I believe Davenport was de got to deal with some of that um, a couple days ago. Okay, moving on. Uh, this is some of the, once again, the SPC false alarm stuff. So right mover sig wind, which is a 65 plus knots. And um, just once again showing you, I'm going to skip through this one pretty quickly actually, but this is some of the stuff they use for false alarm days. QLCS SIG wind. Once again, I'm just showing our, we get our fair amount of QLCSs up across central Iowa as it expands off to the east and southeast. And supercell SIG hail, so once again, two inch plus. And the main focus is off to our west with that and the more arid 
areas as well. So once again, that you can find that paper on their web page. So once again, you know, the SPC metal analysis has been a big help for all of us in the forecast field and offices. And um, a lot of this data that we were using when we went through this environmental data, we've used their SPC metal analysis, which is based on the rock reanalysis and now the RAP. And um, the big thanks to Van Wald over at the office in Omaha. He's been running the SBC metal analysis archive for the sectors over there, so we pull off data that, um, quite often from that page. So on this page right now, just kind of a quick review. Um, obviously, this isn't today, but uh, from the regular page, they do have a thing now where you can double click anywhere on the on the map, and it'll come up with a graphic such as this, where it has from their environmental data and distribution. Um, cases that are favorable, and that's the red bars um, that are across the favorable areas that have had tornadoes um, with certain um, different all tornadoes, fake tornadoes, uh, QLCSs, and et cetera. And so that's pretty um, good to use um, for, for those of you outside of Central Iowa from this study. And uh, if you continue on, um, it gives different things such as tornadoes during time of day, diurnally, and months, et cetera and also um, tracks over the time, time frame. So that's a nice addition that they've done uh, recently and just this year. So moving on, um, you're probably going to get tired of seeing box and whisker plots, but uh, Kevin Deitch, which, as I mentioned, is off in Louisville now, did a lot of uh, good plots here, and then we'll move on to some different ones. But what we have on here is uh, different parameters and tornado day, and either yes, a tornado day, or no. And for 0 to 3 kilometer Cape, you can see this once again for central Iowa, not a lot of difference. But once again, the tornado day was slightly higher with the 0 to 3 kilometer Cape. Moving on to 0 to 3 kilometer VGP, once again, there is some difference there. Um, certainly on the yes days, there is more VGP as opposed to the days that we had false alarms on with no tornadoes. 0 to 1 kilometer shear, this will be something we'll look at more. That was actually a bigger discrepancy. And I should point out on these box and whiskers that the boxes are showing, once again, the lower values at 25% um, percent, and the 75% is at the top, and the black line in the middle is the median. And I'll show some means as well later on. But So once again, the black line is the median. But in this median, uh, on the no days, we were roughly 21 um, knots. And on the yes days, we were closer to 27 knots on the 0 to 1 kilometer shear. So a fairly significant difference with that. Uh, 0 to 6 kilometer shear, there, once again, there's some difference, but nothing that um, stood out. And the same with the um, BRN shear as well. So nothing significant. Effective bulk shear, once again, and you're noticing a trend. Obviously, on the yes days, most of them are higher, the parameters in the near storm environment is certainly more favorable overall, but nothing that stands out um, greatly with it. But the effective bulk shear is a little bit higher, more of a 41, 42 on the no days and closer to 48 on the yes days. Effective SRH, we'll review this a lot more um, down the line. But certainly um, what we found, there is some certainly some differences, differences there on the effective SRH. And certainly it's one of the focuses that we'll be looking at is low-level parameters, the effective SRH, the 0 to 1 kilometer shear. Um, you know, looking at the SPC page and looking at the folks out to the west, once again, in the drier regions, um, the LCL heights for your tornado days do seem to be, you tend to have more tornadoes, certainly, with LCLs with over 1,000 meters. Um, for us, here in central Iowa, our tornado days are typically more closer to 800 to 850 meters. So this is actually a big discrepancy for us um, across central Iowa, basically on days where the LCLs below 1,000 meters. Um, certainly much more favorable for tornadic activity as opposed to above. Mixed layer cave, um, not a significant difference there as well with uh, most unstable caves. So once again, um, not showing much there. SIG tour parameter effective. A um, little bit of a difference, especially with the medians, where the median is a little bit less than one with the no days. Um, and pretty close to two on the yes days. And the fixed parameter, um, 
certainly on the update it's, it's much lower, closer to 1.1, 1.2. And again, on the no days, we're below 1 with that. So another nice plot that Kevin put together here is uh, 0 to 1 kilometer shear. And what we're showing, um, tornado days on the left and non-tornado days on the right. And what you're seeing is basically on days where there's 10 knots of shear or less, um, we didn't have very many tornado days with our on those days, but certainly much more false alarms on the non-tour days. So that's one of the things we look at. So certainly uh, 10 knots seem to be a significant parameter here. This is kind of messy, but basically what we have highlighted here is um, favorable LCLs, so 1,000 meters or less in the blue, and the red is I've bumped up the shear to 25 knots or more. And basically in that lower right um, panel, you're seeing on tornado days we have shear more, uh, 0 to 1 kilometer shear, 25 knots or more, and LCLs uh, below 1,000 meters, where on our non-tour days, you know, certainly the we don't have the overlap between the shear and the LCLs. It's more in the other three quadrants. So that seems to be somewhat significant as well. And as I mentioned with the LCL heights, uh, I thought I had to, uh, I guess I don't have it on here, but once again, here's the plot. And if you look to the left of the 1,000 meters or, no, or lower, once again, a lot of them uh, are off to the left. And the, this is compared to the LFC height, which we didn't find anything significant with that. So once again, another one with a zero to one kilometer shear is surface based cape. And something Kevin pointed out on this also is that uh, anything where you see the shear greater than 45 knots, basically um, relatively few false alarms on those days. And as you can see on the tornado days, we had, certainly had more numbers during then. So only one false alarm or maybe two if you count the line um, on our non-tour days. Effective SRH, seeing that a, a parameter here below 100 uh, meters per second squared. And this is actually compared to mixed layer cape, but certainly, so we're kind of focused here, though, on the effective SRH. And you can see a lot more false alarms on days where it's below 100. Now, certainly our land spouts that we have today, those aren't, we tend not to have a lot of effective SRH for those around with the basically stalled boundaries very little kinematics and low levels. But um, on our non-tour days, you can see we've had one false alarm, or one tornado day. With our uh, data set now, we've had another one I'll show you later that was just earlier this year, um, just actually a couple weeks ago. That I'll focus a little more on that. It had effective shear um, less than 100. Hey, Rod, this is Ron here in San Louis. Now, this includes all convective modes, is that correct? Correct, yes. We'll uh, focus a little more on uh, splitting it up here in a little bit. Okay, but uh, our convective modes, yeah, so we, yes, we'll get into that shortly. Thank you very much. So, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, so this is all convective mode, sorry. Question for you, if you don't mind. Yes, go ahead. Hey, on your zero to three kilometer cape, what parcel is that? Is that a mixed layer uh, parcel up to three kilometers? Correct, yes. All right, thank you. So an effective bulk shear, uh, once again, anything over 60 knots, seem to be, um, had very few false alarms with it. Here's a box and whiskers uh, plot, and um, we didn't quite split them up as uh, SPC did. So as you see, we have a no tour, non-tour days on the left-hand side. Um, overall, so that's all um, tornadoes in our area. Supercell, so basically our class thing. We included uh, supercells, discrete, you know, within a line, et cetera, QLCS, um, H, we separated out HP supercells, and as I mentioned, uh, we do have a lot of hybrids, which are almost a supercell HP hybrid, and really we haven't separated those out at all, and those are, I've kind of moved the hybrids actually more into the HP category at this time, so we'll just realize that's where those have been moved to. Uh, weak TOR is your ES0s and EF1s, and then SIG, SIG TOR is uh, EF2 or greater, and then just for... Uh, if anybody wants to compare our land spouts or more of our days where we're doing a lot more, uh, having the instability and stretching at the low levels, obviously the land spouts are going to have a completely different uh, near storm environment with it. But so looking at the effective shear and on our non-tour days, and I have the uh, means and medians at the bottom, 
And once again, the black line in the middle is the uh, median on the box and whiskers. But certainly our non-tour days um, is less than our other um, days with tornadoes. Uh, if you look at our mean, our mean is actually even more lower than that with 185, um, with the next lowest around 236 with our week tours, which, which would make sense. And then, yeah, for comedy's sake, our land spots are at 15 with that. But so there is certainly some difference on the near storm environment with our effective shear. Now the SBC analysis has, uh, with Thompson et al. 2012, and you can look at that, and I believe it covers all their data set as well, where they have discrete right movers, cluster right movers, lines, hybrids, um, QLCS, and marginal right movers just organized. And here's kind of the data they've seen with it. So a lot of it's generally um, greater than 200. The big difference um, for them, and once again, we're comparing apples and oranges because they're doing two-inch hail or greater in the 65-knot winds where we're just doing false alarm tornadoes. But So a big difference here is our QLCS. Our QLCS uh, effective shears were much higher, near 300, um, where they have, or their data set has 181 for the median. Uh, moving on to zero to one kilometer shear, so we're just doing our focus on those three. And once again, uh, the non-tours are lower than everything else besides their land spouts, as expected. And this is one of the things that when Kevin was doing his analysis was significant uh, with it. Once again, QLCS had much more low-level shear for our area. HPs did as well. But overall, uh, compared to the weak tours and the non-tours, uh, the weak tours are closer to 25, 25 and a half in the mean median, where it's closer to 21 to 22 with our non-tours with it. So certainly lower there. LCLs, as we mentioned earlier, uh, as well. So for Iowa, um, the median was 1,000 for central Iowa, where everything else is uh, basically 900 or below, and in, in the 800s for medians. And the means uh, are greater than 1,000 meters for our non-tours and more of a 900 to 950 for almost everything else for our area. But So once again, uh, the higher LCLs, lower effective shears, and zero to one kilometer shear seems to be significant for our false alarm tornado days. And just one more graphic. Uh, this is uh, Thompson's et al. Uh, 2012 mixed layer LCLs. And I should have mentioned those are mixed, L uh, are mixed LCLs, mixed layer LCLs as well. But uh, they basically have on their QLCS non-tours above 1,000 meters. And um, with the right mover non-tours are above 1,000 meters as well. But once again, this encompasses an entire data set, so it probably includes um, areas out west, once again, would typically have tornadoes uh, with 1,000 meter LCLs or higher. So for our near storm environment observations, just a quick review for DMX. And you know we hit on mainly the mixed layer LCL height, effective SRH, the 0 to 1 kilometer shear. And certainly most of these parameters are included in the SIG TOR product um, that they have as well. And I forgot to put the formula in here for you, but you can find that. Um, but LCL, once again, good cutoff for us is 1,000 meters or lower. Uh, effective SRH, generally 100 meters squared per second squared in most cases for us. And 0 to 1 kilometer shear, very rare, um, less than 10 knots. Very probable, greater than 42 knots. And then we had, um, for non core cases, around 21 and for even weak tour cases, closer to 25, 26. And one thing, so as we all do when we go through our tornado decision-making process, we usually look for our three elements, which is our um, spotter reports, our near store environment, and what radar data shows. So we're going to move on to our radar data um, next. And I'm not going to show you a ton of box and whiskers here, but, so you can all have a sigh of relief there for that. But one thing I did look at as well for the tornadic versus non-tornadic is basically shear. So this isn't VR shear. This is just the shear added up. And so basically V in plus V out and what it equals. So for our tornadic and for supercells, it's the only thing I have separated out this time. And this is at the time of the tornado warning. So I didn't go in when it, everything else spun up. And we actually had our tornado because it's certainly the tornadic was stronger yet. So this is that time of warning time. So our supercells generally had 81 knots of VR shear for tornadics and 
little bit less, 71 knots or so with our non-tornadics, and overall uh, tornadic was 75 and 68 with our non-tornadic. And obviously with our QLCS uh, type uh, tornadoes, it seems like our velocity, uh, rotational velocity or shear is certainly less. Um, but Rod, I don't have that. All Rod, this, this yep. is Ron again. Are you looking at values just within the lowest elevation angle, or are you consuming the lowest two elevation angles for these values? Oh, yes. Yeah, so actually this is the max below uh, 10,000 feet, I believe, which, yes, for QLCS, that's even lower than that. So how far are you going out in distance? So in my mind, okay, if I go 150 kilometer range, that center beam at 150 is up around 10,000 feet or close to 9,000 feet, I believe, someplace up there. So you're including way out to about 150 kilometers, someplace in that range? No, I forgot to mention that as well. No, it's everything within 60 nautical miles. Of the, of the radar. Okay, thanks very much. I appreciate the information. Sure, not a problem. Okay, so the one box and whisker plot for the radar, um, just to show you, there's not a lot of uh, significance here. Whoops, sorry. thought I had a bar on there. But for non-tour days, it was roughly um, 68, as we showed earlier, and closer to 78, 80 with our supercells. Um, low top supercells, which I'm not going to get into, or what call our mini supercells, more of a cooler season. For us, it's more of a late March to April time frame. Um, it seems like our shear is much less with that, our, our, our um, velocity shear, so VN plus V out. Um, for our effective shear and our low level um, parameters, certainly the effective SRH and everything for those low tops is much higher. It tends to be more of a three to 400 for us. And the HP than the QLCS. So the QLCS, I forgot I did have that calculated up. So it is, that was a little bit lower the QLCS type stuff, which is to be expected as well. Mesocyclone depth, so once again, um, this was within the 60 nautical miles, so we had higher resolution. Um, for tornadic, uh, our, and I'm just, this is, uh, I didn't try extrapolating anything, so from our lowest, uh, lowest uh, 0 0.5 where the mesocyclone was be able to detect it to our meso up to the loft. That, so it's whatever scan was, I didn't try to extrapolate between scans where there was one, a mesocyclone was detected and where there wasn't. Um, but overall the tornadics were a little bit deeper um, than our non-tornadics. And certainly something more for the future um, is looking more at the mesocyclone diameter and duration which um, I believe Ron and Ray Wolf and Atkins and all of them have all looked at um, in the past as well, their past papers. So it's the most common reasons for us for false alarm tornado warnings, and it's kind of interesting. So I, we didn't have a lot of data from last year with the drought. We only had eight tornado warnings our entire forecast area last year, and we only had one non, or one false alarm day for last year. And we went, I believe we went over a year last year without a tornado in our forecast area. So. Um, well, obviously we're making up for that this year with all the stuff that's going on. But um, for us, it was uh, tornado warnings that were issued for shear couplets associated with surging cold pools, and we'll get into that, and advancing rear flow and in inflow jets. We'll have a couple examples of that. Um, these were actually typically associated with uh, more of a QLCS non mesocyclone type situations, uh, not your typical QLCS uh, where you have all the mesal vortices along the leading edge. but. I will talk about, I'll show you what that will be more later. And as I mentioned, the Atkins et al. paper, uh, I believe that looked at more of the June 29, 1998 system with their tornadic meso vortices tend to be stronger and longer lived than their non-tornadic counterparts with that. So, um, so an example of our surging cold pool and rear, rear inflow jet example is this is a system that's moving across central Iowa, moving to the uh, south-southeast. And here's the initial scan, and I have an arrow on the left-hand side as it's moving southward. Oops. Okay, sorry. We'll jump to the environment then. So this is the red star will show our effective SRH in that region. So it's roughly around 50 um, meters squared per second squared. I'll let it catch up here because I did it back, so I might mess everybody up there. Um, so what we looked at earlier for us, it was uh, that's not real favorable less than 100. Looks like we're catching up. Um, zero to one kilometer shear, um, generally less than 10. And as we mentioned, a lot of 
rarely do we have tornadoes with uh, zero to one kilometer shear less than 10. And our LCL height on this day was generally above 1,000 uh, meters off the FCC mesal analysis. And I should mention that the, I guess I forgot to mention, the FCC mesal analysis um, generally, um, if anything that, th that occurred at 30 minutes between the top of the hour and 30 minutes after we used the mesal analysis data from that top of the hour, otherwise we defaulted over to the, 20, the next hour. So say if it occurred at 2135Z, um, assuming that the environment wasn't washed out, we defaulted back to the, or we moved on to the 22Z data. Uh, if for some reason it was, you know, the storms moved through and washed everything out, we would go back to the 21Z. But in general, um, 30 minutes was a cutoff to move into the next uh, hour. Okay, so back to our case with the surging cold pool rear and flow jet example. So you can see our rear and flow jet surging ahead. So what basically I have is uh, on the right-hand side, um, the radar's to the south. Um, so we have our inflow still off to the right, still moving into the storm up towards where you can see Fort Dodge and off to the right of Webster. And the rear and flow jet is marked on there as well. Moving to the next scan, um, things starting to look somewhat ugly. I mean, certainly reflectivity is going to look ugly here, but you can see where the rear inflow jet continues to punch out, and maybe a little bit of a couplet, or what I'd call a shear couplet, off to the right of the rear inflow jet there, um, beginning to develop. Next scan, we issue a tornado warning with that, and I'm showing once now, once again, this is a 0 0.5 scan, and this is actually, in this case, was the um, had this what we'd call the strongest couplet with it, but certainly looks uh, much, pretty ugly on radar here. But what's occurring here is that rear inflow jet's punching out. Um, look at the storm structure. We actually have uh, new development out ahead and overhanging with this storm that's occurring with that, what looks like it's pooching out there on the left-hand side of the tornado warning. So that's kind of somewhat the cause of the echoes off to the left. And now that looks like we have a hook there and what couplet we do have starting to rotate back into the cold air. And this seems to be a common occurrence with our false alarm tornado warnings. That get this rear inflow jet, get a little bit of a couplet at the uh, inflow and outflow intersection, and get this couplet that tends to rotate back into the cold air. And once that occurs, it uh, basically um, it's over. It does seem that we do have maybe a, a tornadic threat initially maybe a quick spin up, but once it moves back in the cold air, it, it shuts off pretty quickly. And you can see how it continues to rotate back behind the gust front. Okay, we'll move on to the next uh, one where we also have, and it's somewhat of a similar process, but the HP to bow echo transition, um, false alarms with that. And you've all seen um, these diagrams from Muller et al. And they've been since modified of how we get the outflow on the rear inflow jets and basically our transition to a bow echo with it. So an example of this one, and I've, I've already gone a little bit into the process here so we don't have too many slides, but uh, the storm's moving now. The, you can see the radar, at least on the right-hand image, is off to the uh, east-northeast. System's moving off to your east, and we've already got some type of outflow occurring and something pooching out, and you can see actually in the radar reflectivity it, echoes and greenfield, you actually see some type of a gust front starting to move out ahead. And we do have some type of an echo developing uh, to the northwest of greenfield. And at this time, there's, I don't have the, there's no tornado warning yet out for this system yet. Um, you can see it looks, once again, pretty ugly on radar. But whatever echo we do have was, is starting to really rotate back into the cold air again. And I'm just going to keep moving through this as fast as the low. You can see it's almost becoming uh, more cyclonically divergent as it moves out. And um, no tornado warning yet. And continues to pooch out. Next scan. And then our warning comes out. So in this case, there may have been a threat, possibly for a quick spin up once again um, on this. But by the time we've issued the tornado warning, it's already gotten in back into the cold air, it's already becoming divergent, and so if we issued a tornado warning on this, we probably should have did it earlier. Um, nothing did occur with this, but in the thought process, once again, you know, in your um, conceptual model, what's going to occur once you issue that tornado warning if it'll continue? Um, uh, next thing we're going to look at is a, the supercell false alarm we had over Des Moines uh, earlier this year. Uh, May 20th is the same day as the EF5 down 
um, in Moore, Oklahoma. Uh, and that's the environment wasn't real good. Um, our signatures really weren't great with it, but we had this system moving across our Des Moines metro. There's a lot of ugly wall clouds with it. Some were weakly rotating. There was a weak funnel that actually was to the northeast of the actual wall clouds. It wasn't even associated with the wall cloud. So Carl and I were talking about that. What was it associated with? Was it uh, more land spouty out ahead of it? Um, really didn't really fit with the metal cycle with it. And I'll show you an image of that. Um, but here's an example of one of the wall clouds. You can about imagine. So we're getting all these reports of wall clouds, rotating wall clouds. So our office ended up issuing uh, three tornado warnings on this day and eventually um, went back to our near store environment and saw it wasn't favorable, and I'll show you that in a moment. But um, based on near store environment, we ended up um, didn't issue any more tornado warnings after that. Um, with no reports, no tornado warnings we could issue based on near store environment. Uh, this is one of the funnels uh, coming up here in a moment that one of our interns, Kevin Scow, took on that day. So we can see real small, kind of almost wispy looking off to the northeast of the uh, of the mesocyclone itself and of the wall cloud. And certainly, so you have a, you know, this is a day where you had a funnel cloud over top of our metro area. You know, it's very tough to hold off on a tornado warning that day. But um, environment-wise, let's look at our three that we've been looking at. Effective SRH is roughly around 100 meters a second squared. Uh, you know, that's been our cutoff. Overall, with supercells, we'd like to see closer to 200 for our area. Uh, zero to one kilometer shear was uh, between 10 and 15 on this day, and that's loading. And our LCL heights were closer to 1250 on this day, so unfavorable there as well. Uh, I believe I have one more case. Uh, earlier this year, we did have. Uh, one day that was kind of atypical and ended up being an EF3 tornado across um, our north. And there's very little radar signatures with it. We did have, certainly have a supercell up across that area. Uh, they did issue a PDS box that moved it was into our area, but you can see once the, this image loads that the effective SRH was actually much more favorable as you get to our east of our area and towards Chicago and into Davenport's area. Um, and maybe parts of La Crosse's area, but uh, for us, the effective SRH is much lower, so they did expand the PDS box into us, but the conditions were really le much less favorable with it, and we'll get into what this played in a moment. Uh, zero to one kilometer shear for this was actually less than 10, and I didn't have it in that data set earlier, as I mentioned. LCLs were favorable, around 750 meters. Uh, on this day, it's very well possible that our instability and stretching parameters may have played a much bigger role in our tornado that day. It almost, at looking at the images, and I failed to put one in here, but it looked more land spouty initially overall. As I mentioned, there's very little radar signatures at 6,000 feet with it, um, and it was the F3 intensity, which is quite in interesting with it. But you can see here, certainly, your 0 3 kilometer cape um, it's right along the gradient, pretty good surface vorticity with it. Um, we had a low pressure just moving off to the east, and actually, if you look, if you can see the surface wind field, and it's very close to intersection, or there could have been some local enhancement there um, in the low-level winds there, and may have actually locally enhanced some shear there as well. So that may have played a role as well. It's not showing up in the data with it. So that's just an interesting day. Now, the one thing that I was going to mention on that day is, so we did have the one EF3 tornado, and then we. Uh, ended up issuing 10 straight false alarm tornado warnings uh, for other tor other things that day. So parts, things that could have played a role in that, where we did have an EF3 already. We did have a PDS box out, though the fav more favorable conditions were off to our east. But um, overall, at the near storm environment that we were looking at, it overall was not favorable with it. So, uh, so suggestions to reduce tornado false alarm, be judicious when considering your warnings, uh, especially with weak or unorganized couplets in more weaker shear environments. As we mentioned, use your conceptual model, envision what's gonna, how it's gonna evolve, and note the position of the couplet. Is it rotating back into the cold air? Is it rotating in the cold air without flow out running it? Now, obviously, that doesn't work real well with our cyclic storms, because we can get those, uh, and we could have a new mesocyclone develop with that. So I've seen 
uh, that doesn't always work, so certainly be aware of your situation. With it, future work, uh, the parameters tend to average themselves out over time. Uh, but we'll continue to look more at individual cases and see what may have been the missing ingredient with it. Um, we'll continue to expand our radar signature review as well and uh, expand our false alarm cases to storms not that didn't have tornado warnings. So we could do something similar to what SPC has done as well, maybe look at storms with 2-inch hail or 65 grade or not winds as well. And those references, most of those you can find on the SPC page and then the Atkins et al. Uh, with Ron and Ray um, was another uh, good paper. And another one is still um, works well today yet with that, with especially with the middle vortices, et cetera, and the QLCS situations. So with that, um, is there any questions? Yeah, this is Al in Pleasant Hill with a comment for your future work. Just for kicks, you mentioned uh, going look at some of those cases for uh, a missing ingredient, or however you put that. You might consider, actually, maybe you did. I, I dialed in about five minutes late on the call and mentioned this already, so I apologize if you discussed this. But uh, look at surface data, not off the SPC page, to see what, if any, perhaps pre-existing outflow boundary and or bare clinic zone may have been present uh, that you have with the, with the mesonet up there. That that might open open the door to, uh, to get you some answers. Just a thought. No, that's a good point. No, we didn't discuss that at all, and that wasn't included. So, yeah, thank you for the comment and suggestion. Well, thank you, uh, Rod and, uh, and Carl also. I uh, appreciate you uh, all being here today. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.